Welcome everybody, this is Grandmaster Alexander Landerman with a new series and we're gonna continue doing pawn structures but uh, we're rounding that up and now we're gonna talk about the topic called uh, pawn chains. Now pawn chain, I'll show an example. So very often pawn chains occur in the opening called the French defense. Why is it called a closed opening? Because after we go e4, e6, d4, d5, let's say white plays e5, and we're gonna cover other moves as well. But first we're gonna look at some games with e4, e5, the advanced French. It's a pretty solid opening, it's a very also interesting opening. One of the Grishuk's favorite. The idea is to fixate the pawn structure with pawns on d5 and e6, d4, e5. So now the structure is more or less locked. The center can only be challenged now with break moves such as c5 and f6, this pawn center. And naturally white has for now a little bit more space. So what should we do when a pawn has a space advantage? Of course we have to challenge it by playing c5 first. And now white logical plays c3. And now we get this nice pawn chain where the base of the pawn chain is the b2 pawn which supports this whole big pawn chain like this, all the way up to the pawn on e5. And sometimes we even get the pawn on f4. And black's chain for now is from d5 to f7, where the f7 being the base of the pawn chain. And in both cases, the base is going to be very, very hard to get to. And now there can be two structures that can arise. Either if black plays c4 and the pawn chain will be even bigger, but then even though black's space will be secure, but on the other hand, then white's space will also be secure. Or at some point black might take. And then after takes, now this d4 pawn suddenly becomes the base of the pawn chain. And that's the one that's going to be the one that they're going to be trying to attack. Because the d4 pawn is kind of like a backward pawn. It's now only a piece can protect it. So the d4 pawn could be put pressure on because the b2 pawn, let's say, could be hard to put pressure on. So right now it might seem complicated. So I'm going to show you some examples just so that you see what I mean by pawn chain. So knight c6. Well, queen b6 was played, but okay, it's going to usually transpose. Knight f3 and knight c6. There's also a move bishop d7 here with the idea of bishop b5, but it's considered theoretically maybe not as good because of some pawn sacrifices, but don't completely trust my word, you know, you want to check that for yourselves. But anyway, this ended up transposing into the main line. Basically, black's playing queen b6, knight c6 in order to put pressure on this d4 pawn. Now, the main idea of this opening for black is that, well, in this game, white played a3. Seems like a very strange move. Why would you lose a tempo when you're supposed to develop? Well, white has some concrete problems. Ideally, White wants to develop this bishop on f1 and castle, right? But if he does that, he needs to know where. And right now, the only two sensible squares to develop the bishop are d3 and e2. But if white goes bishop d3, there's a concrete problem. That black could take this now, takes. And now, of course, not knight takes d4 because of takes, takes, and bishop b5 winning the queen. But bishop d7. And now it's actually rather awkward to defend this d4 pawn. And once again, there's a lot of theory on this, you know, sometimes white sacrifices a pawn and plays a gambit. And if white goes there, then black goes knight b4 with a very comfortable game. Let's say bishop a4, even queen a6. And uh, yeah, this black's doing really well here because he has big threats and he's going to be doing really, really well. So the point is that bishop d3 is a desirable move, but concretely, it's going to probably have to sacrifice a pawn. Or another move is bishop e2 which some people prefer, but then you can take and go knight h6, and then black will add pressure on this square, and taking is not going to be good because of queen takes b2 intermediate move. So the idea is, white has concrete problems developing the bishop, so therefore he plays a very logical move, a3. And it might seem like a loss of a tempo, but white in fact is trying to develop harmonious, like he's trying to play b4, and then get the bishop potentially to b2 and solidify the d4 point, the base, so that it's well protected and only then develop the bishop to the desired square d3. So there are a lot of moves here. 
Knight H6 is very interesting, which I believe a George, which I believe Emmanuel Berg talks about in his French book, and it might be the more fashionable one. But even a5 is playable, but in this game, black played c4. And we're gonna see some games involving pawn to c4. And now we really get a typical pawn chain, where now the structure has really fixated. Black has this pawn chain from f7 to c4, which is gonna be hard to touch, in particular because white played a3. And uh, notice that in some games where we saw where I was white, and uh, black would play a6, and then I would play c5 because b6 was hard to play. Same thing here, b3 is going to be hard to get in because, you know, simply the pawn is misplaced now on a3. So black, of course, has to play c4 after white plays a3. Otherwise, b3 will chip away in that pawn structure. Likewise, so the way you deal with a pawn chain, the way you try to disrupt it is by either attacking the front of the pawn chain, the pawn on c4, likely with a move like b3, or d3 if possible, but of course here it's not possible, or a pawn all the way on f7, the base. But of course in this case, the base cannot almost possibly be attacked. It's almost unrealistic, unless you have a massive attack. And likewise, white's pawn chain is from b2 to e5, and again, the only way to attack it, since the base is so far away and almost cannot be touched, is to attack the front of the pawn chain with a move like f6 at some point. Or even f5 bypassing the pawn, which in some way, shape or form, encourages white to take on passant. So, let's look at some games and see how white can proceed in a situation like this. So, white played the move knight d2. Logical move. Now, Black has to play a very important move, knight a5. Because if black plays a move like bishop d7 first, the logical looking move, then after b3 takes, takes, white's already going to be better. Because after rook b1, let's say, the pawn on c3 is still pretty solid, but now black lost his trump, his space advantage, and uh, white's pieces get free, white's going to get bishop comfortably to d3, and white's better. I actually won a game like this once with a white against the... Uh, pretty strong player, around 2300. So it's very important to play knight a5. It's a prophylactic against b4. So, because of course before you take on Poissant, b3 is just take. And now white played g3 in this game. Bishop e2 is also played, and uh, we might also, we'll take a look at that stuff from the black side as well in the next video. So g3, bishop d7, and now white played bishop g2. There are other moves, but in this game, Grishuk preferred bishop g2. Castles queenside. And here black plays in an old-fashioned way. And Vitigov, by the way, is a 2700 player. Already was 2700 back in 2010. And he is a well-known theoretician. As far as I know, he's written books on the French defense. So he's one of the biggest theoretical experts on the French. So let's see how the two big guns, two big theoretical guys, approach this position. So white just castled, and now black played f5. And this might be a little bit premature. I mean, this move often is good in a lot of other cases, but here it might be premature. Black might have, maybe was better advised to do something else. And now the idea is white definitely wants to take this, because otherwise Black will have h6, g5, and will get some kind of an attack. And suddenly, black's pawn structure is very secure, and this bishop on g2 is not going to have a lot of prospects. So white naturally takes. He gave up his space advantage, but now he's going to be able to put some pressure on the weak e pawn. Takes. Rook e1. Bishop d6 was played. It was novelty back then. The idea is to try to play e5. But now bishop h3, attacking the e6 pawn. Black played bishop c7, logical move. And now white played rook b1. He's trying to play b4 anyway. And trying to open up the queen side. King b8, b4, cb, knight takes b3. And after knight e7, knight d2, queen c6, knight c5. Maybe black could have played better, but the way it happened here, white already got a very, very dominant position, as far as you could see. 
Okay, so black played knight f5, knight b3, knight takes b3, queen takes b3. So it's clear that white has a lot of initiative. His pieces are very good. He has pressure along the b-file. And uh, he has pressure along the e-file. So white can really make a lot of use of his semi-open files. b6, a4, bishop c8. So he did not want to trade off the bishop because he thought that his knight was potentially strong. Although it was also possible because it weakens e6. But he chose a4, bishop c8, a5, and now e5. Well, trying to at least create some kind of counterplay, challenging the center, otherwise he's going to eventually be overrun on the queen side. a, b, a, b. Now Grishuk makes a mistake and plays bishop a3, and now the game gets a little bit messy. Bishop f1 was really strong with a big initiative ed, and then queen a3. And then white has a big attack in this sort of way. Variation is complicated, but goes to show that white is better. Close to winning. The rest is not that important. He allowed this knight h4 blow, which he missed. And then uh, took. And then, okay, rook e6 was a mistake. Bishop f5, black was very much in the game actually, because he got rid of this very strong bishop on g2. But okay, so rook e6, and now bishop c5 is very strong, b5, knight c3, but again, it's probably time pressure. The game was very, very complicated, so naturally both sides are in time pressure. But now eventually white crashes through and uh, plays bishop f8, attacking d5, and the game is closed over. And here, basically, black resigned. Down two pawns, but no counterplay. So this was a rather complicated game, but this goes to show what are white's ideas. How black breaks with f6, white breaks with b3, but sometimes playing f6 could be a little bit premature, especially if the white bishop is placed in a way where the weak e6 pawn could be potentially a target. So this was this game. Next game I want to show is a relatively quick game, also by Grishuk. So e4, e6, d4, d5, once again e5. And here he's playing a much lower rated, but still, it's good for you guys to see the idea. c5, c3, knight c6, knight f3. This is more of a little bit of an introductory video to this whole concept anyway. Queen b6, a3, c4, knight d2. And black played a very early f6 here in this game. Didn't play knight a5, blocking b3, but played a very quick f6, which a lot of people might be tempted to do, because why not? After all, we were, we were taught to challenge the space. So this game is a very nice illustration of what happens if black plays f6 a bit too soon, when white did not declare his development yet. So white played bishop e2 in this case. For now, white is just simply ignoring this pawn on e5. And black decided to just take it. Maybe it was better to not actually help white's pieces get more active, but just play a move like knight a5 anywhere, bishop d7. But he just decided to took, so black played in a very straightforward way. Well, it's a 2100 player, so he's just playing in a very straightforward way. Knight takes e5, knight takes e5, de. And now he played bishop c5, which also might not be the best move. Maybe knight e7 was more accurate. Castles a 97. I mean, black's moves look very logical. It looks like he just challenged the space, isolated the pawn chain. Black still has this very nice pawn chain, and now he's developed in a very harmonious way. What could be more logical, you would think? But before, you know, this break should have been stopped. And the problem is concretely, black's now forced to take, and after knight takes b3, simply this bishop is now going to be actually in an awkward square being under attack. And after castles takes takes queen d3, white is already better. Because even though his pawn structure not been might have been compromised with pawns like this, but white does have two bishops. White still has that space advantage. And uh, white is actually quite a bit better. So challenging the space right away does not necessarily solve all of problems. There are other factors like two bishops, development, and stuff like that. 
So knight c6, queen g3. Uh, putting the queen in the way to try to get some initiative. Rook f5, bishop h6, g6, bishop d3, rook h5, bishop e3, queen e7, bishop takes. And okay, that was, I guess, a blunder. I guess he got too active with the rook. Maybe he could have played a little bit better, but the point is that another bad moment out of six is that potentially the king gets a bit airy. And that's exactly what happened in this game. So bishop d3, rook h5, bishop back, queen e7, and bishop takes g6, rook takes e5, and the rest of the game is a mop-up. Bishop here, queen there, takes, takes, and finally bishop takes. Well, otherwise now bishop d4 was going to win the whole rook. So takes, intermediate move, and the rest of the game is a mop-up. White's up an exchange and a pawn, and white has open files. And whenever you're up in exchange with open files, it's pretty much hopeless. Okay, of course you want to open up more lines for the rooks. That's very logical. So e4, that's why e4. c4, now white has a passed pawn. And normally down in exchange, it's very hard to defend against the passed pawn. Bishop takes, rook a5 check, king e6, rook takes a7, bishop d5, takes, takes. Rook a6, king d5, and now white transposed into the winning pawn endgame, and uh, white won very quickly right after that. So those were some really nice games. This was a little bit of an introductory to the idea of the pawn chain. And in the next video, we're also going to see some examples from the white side of how white can really put pressure on black in this pawn structure. And eventually, we'll get to some very nice examples from the black side as well. So in the meantime, hope you guys enjoyed this video. And until next time, this has been Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman signing off. Thank you.